Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our first webinar of the GIS Day Series. Uh, this webinar will deal with our product Azimap, and it's titled Advanced Desktop GIS Capabilities in the Cloud. Um, so my name is David McQuillan. I'm the founder and CEO of Azimap, and I'll be running through a short presentation initially, then getting into a live demonstration of some of the functions of the software with an introduction to what it is and what it's about. So, Thank you for your attendance. If anyone has any questions, please uh, type them into the, the, your systems and we will endeavour to answer them towards the end of the presentation. Thank you. Right, so we'll give you some background here as to what uh, Asimap is and, and why we've developed it. So Asimap is a web-based GIS um, which is trying to extend and improve upon um, other GIS systems within your organization. So we can replace desktop systems. We have certainly, we feel enough functionality there, but we also run very well alongside uh, desktop systems for power users within an organization. So. What we try to do with the system is make it as easy to use as possible and to allow organizations to spread GIS throughout their whole organization in a cost-effective way to allow them to uh, have non-GIS users in interrogate and analyze uh, spatial data and generally just allow you, an end user, to get the most out of your data using a GIS system at the highest efficiency of cost. Um, we're backed on databases, so we support uh, Microsoft SQL or PostgreSQL um, at the enterprise level, and then we can also, obviously, with that, if you have other GIS systems which run off spatial databases, we can share the same and write to the same database structures, so it can be our system alongside another system working in tandem. So, a short uh, description here of our, our use case we have here in local government. So, we have developed uh, in league with a local partner a planning search portal in Northern Ireland, and that is a system that allows the end user, both agents and local government uh, representatives and the general public, to search for and target planning information. Um, so, this is all based on open data and. It's a much quicker and easier system for searching the data than was currently available that was directly through central government agencies. And it is based completely, as I say, off open data and allows uh, the final user quite a lot of um, advanced geospatial uh, checks and balances there. So I'll be part of my presentation today. I'll be actually going through loading up some of the data that's involved with this map and targeting it so I can then show you if I have time at the end a demonstration of the, the live product. Um, so our system has also been in use in central government agencies. The case study I'm highlighting here was for the Department of Agriculture in the Republic of Ireland, um, where our system was used for cross-site collaboration uh, within the forestry and agri agriculture departments uh, to allow they have their own GIS custom built, but it, it doesn't uh, security transfer across the multiple sites. And so we used our site alongside that, uh, which helped to allow them to do external digitizing tasks and to speed up decision-making and to also include the non-GIS users in the decision-making process. Um, we also have support for uh, raster information. So the screenshot on the slide here is our own uh, attempt at a cloud-free map of Ireland using the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 information. Uh, but we have a quick and easy repository for raster information, both from Sentinel satellite or um, from aerial surveys. Uh, we can support both with lots of algorithms in there to allow the raster to display properly on uh, on a web-based system. And when you, have, we can even support up to terabytes of data on an enterprise system, uh, where we can set them up as a, a pre a predefined image pyramid to allow for optimum speed, so that's that's one we're quite proud of. Uh, we also, the system is interoperable with other systems. We have integrated the background mapping, obviously, from most of the major uh, worldwide providers. We've also integrated the Ordnance Survey GB, Northern Ireland and OSI Ireland. We have a multiple different choices for address searches, so we can you can choose your address search from Google search, uh, OS Places, which is GB, 
geo directory which is Ireland, and then we can have address data which is GB, and then Photon OSM is our preferred supplier, and it is based on the OpenStreetMap data. So that's all user configurable um, with Google and Photon available on our SaaS offering and the enterprise uh, available for our. Sorry, the, the the whole lot available for our enterprise customers. We have there's also quite uh, an extensive API there, so we can allow for apps to be built around our application. And again, if you have your own address search information or gazetteer information, we can easily integrate that into the system for enterprise customers to allow them to search their own data directly in the in the address search field, as you can see there. Um, yes, yeah, so the JavaScript API has been used by us and a number of other organizations to, de to quickly develop uh, new custom apps which have a map at the center um, and can greatly speed up development um, as much as three times in our experience. And for enterprise customers, we can authenticate against Active Directory uh, directly so that there's, there's no issues with logins or security or sharing. So. Um, on our roadmap this year, we have... Uh, Still to come, uh, 3D mapping, you can see a screenshot here of our prototype, um, so we're aiming to have that delivered uh, in the winter uh, this year, so hopefully December, January this uh, December this year, January next year, we should have the facility to view your data on 3D maps, or view 3D data as well, and we're looking at implementing story maps, and again, in early in the new year, we will have an offline mobile data collection app, which will integrate with the system to allow for the creation of custom forms uh, and custom forms directly from database entries or other previously existing tables and for offline mapping and data capture in the field. So, yeah, I suppose just to review, it's, uh, it's available enterprise, either on-premise or in private cloud, which we can host, or as a SaaS offering, and uh, yeah, our SaaS offering is currently hosted within the EU. Um, just a wee slide there with some of the current customers we have in the UK and Ireland and worldwide. And then some of our contact details. So if you, you can subscribe to our, our Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn feed to get some extra information. So thank you for bearing with me with that quick introduction. So now I'm going to go into the a demonstration of the system, so I will give an introduction of what it is, some of the, the basic functionality, how to create data within the system, how to get data into the system, and then how to style it up, uh, interrogate it, and get some uh, insights into it. So bear with me here, I'll just go to browser. So I have a number of tabs hoping here, hopefully to speed things along um, and uh, uh, define demonstration setup. So we have, this is our main website. So if you were looking to register, if you haven't already registered for our application, you would go to asimap.com and then click on the free 30 day trial. Uh, and then you would fill in your details here. Um, with that then, once you have your details filled in, um, if you're a student, we offer a free uh, basic account for 12 months. You just need to be able to sign up with a, a student based account or verifiable student account. And once you've signed this up and click sign up, you will receive a email address, an email from us, which will be asking for you to, to verify your account. And once you click that link within the email, excuse me, um, you will receive your activation success. And from that point, then you'll be able to log into your account. So when you log into your account, you'll be faced with this view. Now, uh, I have a few maps set up here. Initially, you'll have nothing in my maps because you'll have nothing in your uh, system. So your maps, uh, when you have a few maps in there, will appear in a carousel. And this bottom section is a random selection, created sec selection by us of other customers' maps to give you some uh, inspiration. Um, so if you click on those, you get uh, a working version, a read-only working version of the map in, uh, in an iframe for you to play around with. And as I say at the screen, your own maps will appear up here. So the first thing um, when signing up to the account, you can see on the home page, we can access the different sections. So we have maps, your data catalog, administration section, guides, which is our own uh, doc, docs website, um, and then help desk if you want to directly contact one of our providers or one of our support people for, for assistance. Um, the So this is your dashboard, essentially. Um, if we go to, you can 
directly create a map from here or you can go into the maps to get a map list and I'll just go through those so if we go to the map list these are the existing list of maps that I've created for this demonstration but initially you would just have a demo map and if we click into the demo map here we'll see that it is just a standard map with no data attached which is a polygon map of which we can then go and I will zoom to my location and yep that's where I'm sitting right now and then I can start doing digitizing and stuff in here so I'll show you a real world example of some of the stuff that we're doing uh, in a moment the Data catalog, these are all the data layers that we've, I've imported in the system for this demonstration. You can see that I have three here that have failed to import and then another um, number which are successfully imported. Uh, those are highlighted just within that login session. So whenever you do something with that layer, they just become a normal colored layer. So that's just to quickly envisage that, yes, it was successful importing or unsuccessful. So I will go back to maps. Now all, uh, Data uh, manipulation here can be done either here in the back end console or it can be done directly from the map. So we would advise obviously going directly to a map. So that's what I'm going to do now. So to create a new map, use the create new map button and give the map a name. And at this point we can hit advanced and that'll take us in and allow us to set projections um, or to set a, other fields within there, add layers and generally control or we can hit save and it'll just be saved in the default worldwide projection and we can get straight to the map. So it depends on your use case. If you want to work in a local projection, you would use advanced. And if you want to work in um, just in, in the Mercator projection, then you can just hit go. So we have here now our map surface with no layers attached. So we'll get a little prompt to say, do you want to create or import new or add existing? So existing ones are layers you've already added to the system, which you can add to as many maps as you like or you can create within the system or import. So at this point, and there's a little help video of how to do it there. Um, so I will create import, and in this case, um, I suppose, yeah, I will import data. So data is imported within the system using the drag and drop interface, or you can select, click it to go and select things. So the data formats that we support of import is ship files, tab files, KML, GPX files, SV file geo database, and geo tips for raster information. The CSVs, we support spatial CSVs, which have an XY or lat long, or even a WKT, so CSVs can contain polygon or line information, but we also support CSVs which have no spatial information, which then can be added to the data set within our system. Um, when we drag and drop, I have a number of layers here, um, already pre-organized. So I'm going to, what I have is we have, um, if I click off this, now, this is the website I was talking about earlier, so it's NI Planning Search. So I'm going to bring in some of the data layers that we have here and then just go through how we were would style them up and um, manipulate them. So that's like our end point, which I'll show at the end again. So at this point, I'm gonna drag and drop a number of these layers in here. So I have a zip file containing a CSV. I have a zip file containing two shape files. I have a CSV on its own, and then I have a shape file on its own. So you just drag and drop them all in, and the system will remove any files that aren't applicable, and then it will run through um, where possible. It will set the projections on these layers, and where, um, so those are the shape files. If it's, if it's got a projection attached, if it doesn't have a projection attached, then you can set one. Uh, I know in this case, this is uh, Irish Grid, the old version. And then for CSV data, you always have to set uh, EPSG code and a the type of data which is in within the thing. So in this case, I know this one is 4326 WGS84, and it is point data. So the options I have here when I'm importing a CSV, um, I can select whether I want geometry columns to be kept as attributes. And what that means, if you have an XY column in there, we convert that to geometry within the database. But we can also keep the XY as, as columns, attribute columns. Now, 
I would advise if you're importing points, you'd want to keep the XYs. It's nice to have that information there. If you were importing polygons or lines, it's probably best to leave that unticked because uh, a well-known text representation of a polygon or a line can be very, very large and doesn't really mean anything represented on screen. So I'll tick this because it's a point layer. Then again, we have letters, case, column formats. So the system automatically selects the best column format. So if you have strings in a column, it'll be pulled in as a string. If it's all integers, it'll be pulled in as an integer. Um, and if it's mixed, it's generally pulled in as a string. Um, for us to be able to, and the third one there, sorry, is contain spatial columns. Um, so we, to bring data into the system from a CSV, the spatial columns either need to be named in a certain way. So they either need to be named WKT for the well-known text format. So that's a single column. You can have points, lines, or polygons in it. Um, and then, or else you can have X, Y, or lat and long, or latitude, longitude. Uh, so as any, any column that starts with LAT or LON, doesn't matter what the rest of the word is, just wildcard matched, and that will match up and bring in. So I'll just close that. And for the last one here, I know again that this is slightly newer, 75 Irish grid, and again, that's points. And I will set the geometry columns as attributes again. So once I have all this set up, I can change the names of my layers as I bring them in here. So I'll just give these um, individual names. So at this point, as I say, I have a notification item here. When you're importing a number of files like this, it can take a few minutes to import. So rather than uh, waiting for the system to import them, uh, we, we pass it off to a separate thread, and you get an email sent to you whenever the stuff is imported. So then you can go and continue your work, um, make more additions to the map, uh, and then whenever the system's ready, you just refresh it, and the, the information will be added. So and again, if there's layers there you don't want, you can remove them using the X. So if I save that, again, we'll get a nice little message here. It's telling us, but essentially, we can refresh the page. Our layers may be loaded, or we can wait for the email to come in. Um, and we'll see that coming in a little while here, um, whenever, and I'll show you the example of the email. So to speed us along, I have already pre-imported this stuff. Um, so I'll move on to my next tab. So this is an example of what you would get then um, after you've imported those files, or what we have got. So I have a polygon layer, which is the council boundary. So these are the administrative boundaries within Northern Ireland. Um, and then I have a planning layer. So let's turn these off, which is, um, I think it is, well, let's see. Yep, 11, just over 11,000 entries. Um, then we have the location of police stations in Northern Ireland, and then we have the location of schools in Northern Ireland, and then we have uh, locations of mobile phone mass and mobile phone antenna within Northern Ireland. So at this point, you've got all this data into the map, but as you can see, it's, it's really a splodge of red. So we need to start adding some um, context to this data. And so doing that, we can style it up based on attribute information or location information. So um, before we do that, I'll just go over a little uh, bit about our interface here. So obviously this, we have our map interface. We have zoom in, zoom out, and move, or else you can just use the mouse, drag, drop, mouse wheel in and out. Um, hold shift to zoom to a box location. And then we have our administrator's toolbar open here. So this is all the tools we have available in the map. So I will go through each of those uh, in a later date, uh, or not later date, but later in the presentation for the moment. So these are edit tools or view tools or other tools and map definition stuff. So as an address search, at the minute this map is configured to use a Google address search. So if I was to search for Belfast, yeah, I'll come up the result and click that at Jim's that location. So. And then I can set a routine from that using OSM data. But I will zoom back out again here. So what we want to do to change the style of these layers, if you're an administrator or a map owner, you can click on, you can hover over this to get the legend, or you can click on it, and it will give you the styler options. 
Um, if you're not a map owner or a map administrator, then that's not editable. So I'll show you an example of that later on. So for planning here, uh, initially when we import new layers, uh, we can define, uh, we can go in and change in the back end what the default layer for that, um, what the default style for that layer is. But here I'm going to set new new styles for these maps. So if I've previously created styles, as I have here, I can just apply them. But in this case, I'll show you how to create a new style uh, using the style in Wizard. So in this case, I want to do planning 2017. So that creates me a blank style here, which I can add rules to. So I can add individual rules. I can add a label. I can follow a wizard here to give uh, this data a thematic style, which we're going to do. I can create a point cluster cloud or I can create a heat map. So those are all wizard-based systems, but for this particular data set, we're going to style it on a particular attribute. So I choose point thematic styling. I then have a choice of X cross star triangle square circle. I have size in pixels, and I have, I'm going to choose a size of three in this case, and then we choose an attribute that we're going to style it, and in this case, I'm going to style against the status. And I, once I've chosen that attribute, I can check in the dat, date range here, the different uh, types. So here we have refused, granted, withdrawn, so all planning types, statuses. So here for the color scheme, I can choose a particular color scheme. So in this case, I'm going to choose this one, or if I want to, I can set my own ramp. So over here, I select. And then I can choose a stroke, whether I want it dashed or dotted or no opacity of both uh, the fill and the stroke and the width. So I'll just leave it at default for that one. So I hit OK. So you can see here I now have ranging from green to purple. And if I hit save, that should be applied to our map. Yeah, so there we go. So we just need to run through this for each of the other um, Styles here, it'll only take a second, so I will open up PlayStation. So again, um, if I do um, I am um, yeah, I'm going to set this up with standard point style because if we go to police stations, this is our legend name entry here. I can choose as a standard point or extended icons. So we have within the system categorized over 300 style icons for points, all uh, utilized in the SVG format, so very small and the back to base format. So you can have the point as, as large or as small as you want, it won't make any difference to the the type of the system. So if I go into background here, I can take what is kind of like a police badge, and I'll just set that to blue. And goes okay. You can see here, police station. And if I hit save, again we'll have police stations will appear, as we can see. Uh, and again, I'll just quickly run through for schools. I am going to do again a uh, thematic style. So I'll do a quick. And that is based on the type. So in this case, we have type of school. And what was that? Again, you can see grammar, nursery, primary school, preparatory school, secondary school special. So again, that'll create all the rules, create the names. So and last but not least, we have mobile phone masks. So I'll just quickly create that style in the same method. So again, if you have a number of data sets which all use the same um, structure with the different data, you can create one style and apply it using this existing multiple times. So I already have, I'll just show as an example, a style for mass in there. So if I click that, that'll preload that. So that's one I created earlier. You show different providers on the masks. And there. So there, within five minutes, I assume we have just... Um, 
imported some data, styled it up so it means something more, and we can create groups in here. I'll just show I'll put this into so we have create a new group. So I'm gonna call that group um groups. And again, if I want to put stuff into that, it's just a drag and drop exercise. Again, uh, a non administrative user can do this, but it doesn't save. An administrative user, if they change this order, create new groups, that's saved into the, the map structure. So that's available, um, yeah, straight away for sharing. So if I, I'll just go into some of the other configuration options we have here. So <coughs> within the map, you can see here we have, this is the names as I imported them from earlier, or not quite. Now, just an example, um, can it happen here, but I can go back and see here that I've got uh, email has come in. So the import is finished in that previous layer. And yeah, this is the email you'll get after you've imported a number of files. The green one, marked in green, will be successfully imported. And if it's it's marked in red, if it's been unsuccessful with a reason as to why. Um, I had previously imported some data which was not uh, properly formed CSV, and it came back and, and was able to inform me that the import finished but unsuccessful. So if we go back to that original map and refresh it, we should see the template of what we had there. And um, there you go. So all layers off by default. If I turn those all on, we get the similar uh, zoom to max extent there. So that's the map we've been previously been working on, imported within that time frame. So um, we have, yes, so I can go in and change some of the details for each one of these maps. So if I select from here, I can create a new layer or add import a new layer, add an existing layer, edit this particular layer on this map, which I'll show you now. So in this case, I can now change the, the display name of that. So that's the table name, my workspace. I can set whether it's on or off by default, the scale layers, whether it's my zoom to layer on, on the map load, whether it's the main selected layer on my map, and whether it's even read-only or non-read-only. And if I use a scale display, permanent zoom scale allows me to decide do I want uh, my end user to be able to turn on off this layer at zooms where I have it turned off or not? So quite a lot of configuration options there. Um, in that case, I'll set it to leave it on. At the same time, I can configure my pop-ups here to include all my information, either both pop-ups and clicks. I can have light or dark pop-ups. I can have the data presented horizontally or vertically. I can do that for clicks and hover. Um, I will just, clicks are all on by default and hovers are all off by default. For police stations, I will turn on one um, column with no title. If I save that, it'll refresh the structure of the map, and I should be able to then show you a hover. With the so police stations. You can see that's the hover that I've added there. Let's say that could be configured to be black if we wanted to, or to have the header of town. So, um, we have the, what I wanted to go through then is how, that's how we import data into the system. It's relatively simple, I think. Um, we can also create data within the system, or we can bring data in which is not spatial. So that's what I was going to go through now. Um, so with this data set, we also had a, a set for the hospitals, because we want to do some analysis later based on where uh, a new planning application might be uh, versus where its local school is or where its local hospital is, so that the, the citizen can make better informed decisions about where they may want to buy a site or build a house. So. In this case, we have two options here. Um, I have in here a CSV with, well, it's done, I'll show it in Notepad. Yeah, so 
Yes, tab separated, uh, pipe separated, uh, comma separated are all fine. And that's a list of all the hospitals in Northern Ireland. So there's, there's no address information, so I can't geocode it properly. And there's no, um, or at least I can geocode it, but I can't be sure of the results. Um, and But I can import this in and start digitizing against it, or I can create my data directly within the system. And I'll show you how to do both here now. So if I want to create a new layer within the system on this map, so I'll just zoom it out. We can use the create layer. Again, it'll bring us back here. So rather than use an import layer this time, we will create a new layer within the system. So here I can give a layer name. So when I house I can choose my projection. I'll choose a local projection. We do support the full EPSG channel here. So um, let's see if I was looking for Yep, so we have Egyptian ones here, or we have local, some French ones. So you can just search for words, you can search the numbers if you know them. In this case, I'll search for one of the, the Irish ones, select so that. And then I can choose to have a point line or polygon layer, and then I can choose my default style. So in this case, I will choose a point layer, and the default style on this one is, I'll leave it at point. I don't have one pre-created for that. And active just means whether you want it to be immediately active or not. So if I save that, that'll create a database record in our ASMAP database. Um, so once that's done, uh, once that's done, I will be able to add new attributes to this layer. So now, so all layers have either an ID and a geometry, so spatial information. I can add as many different attributes here as I like after that. So in this case. Hospital name of text type. Um, I can choose how much, what size I want to hold the text, and then whether the data in this is editable or not. It might be a pre-filled um, uh, attribute, or whether when I save something, I have to put something in this field before it allows me to save. So I'll just add that. You can see here I have a new column in there, and I will save and update that layer. Yep, so that has brought that in. So you can see here I have a layer in a hospital's webinar. And it's now it's a completely empty layer, there's nothing in it. At this point then I can start uh, digitizing into that layer. So if I go back to here, um, I don't know why that has changed, but if I go back to, yep, this, so I can search for some of these hospitals and start digitizing into them. So the process for that would be, let's say the, Contrary hospital. So I can do an address search for that. So I found that location. I can zoom to that location. And at this point, then I can use my digitize point. If I was to choose a polygon, that becomes digitized polygons with lots of other digitized options, which we're not going to. Um, in this webinar, uh, digitize point. So I create a point. Uh, and then I will get asked to enter that name, and if I don't, it won't let me save. Point created. So now if I go to that data set, which is browser, we have one point created. Now that's one way of entering this data. We can also, as I say, if we already have this data in a spreadsheet, but with no spatial information against it, we can import that directly into the system, which I'll just do now. So import layer in here, and we have CSV. Again, we can at this point there's no space information. We can choose any projection system we would like. Um, two ML three. And then I want to set here that we don't have geometry columns. Don't need to guess. Well, we do want to guess column formats. We don't have a spatial column, and we want to collect points into this system. And again, that should import in no time at all because it's only got about twelve entries in it. So if, if I refresh the map. Um, Hospitals, there you go. So I can now uh, use one of our tools up here to start work, working through the list to digitize this information. So we have my browse features, which give me a list of all information in the selected layer. 
or I have digitized data which gives me a list of all the information and whether it's mapped or not. So I can order it whether I mapped and then I can run through this work list. So I'll just uh, quickly do a couple here. So digitize, you can see my toolbar has changed. I have now set uh, draw points or draw feature. So I can search for, let's see, this guy. Make sure it's the right location. These aren't always right. Uh, it is. And you can see here that that's now digitized, ready for redigitization. So we'll do another one. So again, so if you had to manually digitize quite a lot of information, this is a nice wee workflow here to allow you to, to do it quick. As you can see, once I've created a new point, it then uh, changes the toolbar back to the same. So I have another version of this map where that's all done. So is it one of these? Yeah, it's in there, it's not styled, but I will add it here. So if you bear with me. One I did earlier, so I add that to the map. It'll refresh and have a new layer on there with the hospitals on it. So let's see. Only one. I added one of the ones that already added. My apologies, folks. And That's them all on now. So I'll just delete this one and I, I add it erroneously. You can see here that uh, I have groups on this map, but this is the pre-prepared map I had earlier, which doesn't have groups on it because you can have as many different maps as you like uh, with different structures against the same data um, and they can be configured differently. So for the purposes of this, I want to compare the plan, the plan information to the hospital information, excuse me, with some of our analysis tools. So the two I was going to talk about today, which we have in use in our plan and search portal, which um, if I zoom in here, so I have, I'm thinking of building a house. I have a sick or Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I have, uh, I have someone sick in my household. I want to be in a certain time zone or a certain time distance of my hospital. So let's say I was looking to build a house here on this road. So we have up here both written and drive time analysis. Um, so if we select drive time analysis, we can create a drive time polygon based on a location um, to see how far away we are from some other things. So in this case, I am going to do intervals. So I want to know 15 minute intervals or in, within 60 minutes of the hospital where my house will land. So if I select my times here, I can choose different colors if I want and select a location on the map. At this point, I will select. So that will draw me out quite quickly, as you can see. A drive time here from the hospital, say 15 minutes. So my original thing here was in 15 minutes of the hospital, 30 minutes and then um, 60 minutes. So that gives me that information to be able to decide if that's a good location or not. Then at this point, uh, I have to wonder um, how close am I to the local schools? Because that's fine and within reasonable driving distance of the hospital. So I'm happy enough that that's okay if my relative's fine. But I want to check here. And I'll turn off the plan information and hospital information. So now I have police stations in the school, so I can check how close am I. So how many schools are within five miles of my location? So again, I can select uh, here and I can say five kilometers from my location. I want to then place a circle. And again, it was about here that we talked about. So you can see here, I can see visually, but I, I don't have any within five kilometers of this location. Um, but I can generate a report and that will tell me that. 
and again, it, uh, when we generate a report here, it actually returns results so, of two schools within that location, um, Brookshin Primary School and Hazelbank Primary School. So those are both within five kilometers, so I know that I'm covered for schools. I can then generate a report, which will allow me to save the data in an Excel spreadsheet. So if I open this up. So I should have an overview. So I, from this location, I searched 5,000 meters, and then I had results. So this is the council area that I'm in, and then the results. So the results in this report are reported by the on layers. So if I regenerate that, um, so based on planning, oh, made a mistake there. I jumped the gun. I need to generate, regenerate the report, and that'll bring in the planning layer to it as well. And again, if I import that, then I'll have the 42 entries or download that. So, And if we take a look at this, we will find, yep, yeah, same point, um, same distance, but we have an extra layer in here. So that's the other the plan applications that have gone up within that location um, and some pertinent information from that. So. This uh, allows a, a citizen or end user to very quickly see, um, and again, I could do that same comparison to see if there's how many phone masks there was near where I am living, if I had that information. So I can see here that there's two within, but if I generate a report, that'll tell me within the, for mass data. Or I could have had them all up and done that one report at once. So I may want to live near a phone mast for good phone signal, or maybe worried about the health scares that were, were talked about. Um, so that is a quick introduction here into how to get data into ASIMAP, what it can do for some uh, analysis for citizen uh, location uh, decision making. We have obviously a lot more tools here on the map. Um, I'll be covering some of that in me or one of my colleagues in future webinars. And certainly we have, if you go to our guide section, we have a full searchable uh, website, full manual, um, number of interactive guides with uh, files to download, that sort of thing, uh, links to so how to use your space analysis. So the information is all there, or there's a lot of information there which gets updated regularly. And I suppose to finish off, I will um, show you an example of the real live planner website here, which has some of these tools attached. So again, we can search. This is a separate little uh, search which has been designed and interacts with our map using a, our JavaScript API. So I can do a Google style search for a word and we'll search across six different fields and give uh, partial examples. And again, if I change that, that is searching instant search based on, yeah. So you can see that's quite powerful. If I select that, then the API kicks in and I zoom to the right location. I can then at this point, my pop uploads, I can do my buffer search from this location, I can link out to planning information, I can print this location, and or I can then the buffer search generate report, I can do my routing or drive times from this location. And I've integrated street view into this map and an attribute search uh, legend. So good to thank you for your time here. Um, and again, any questions that you haven't yet asked, please ask them now and I will endeavor to respond to them. Uh, as best I can. And thank you very much for your time. And I hope you check out our website, check out our app, uh, asmap.com. And uh, hopefully, if you're interested, I'll, I'll see you as one of my colleagues. We'll see you next week, the next webinar. Thank you very much. I'll just deal with the questions then. Thanks.